Hey, did you know that the uh, Social Security Office of the United States of America rolls out top 10 names from the previous year? Uh, they do us a favor. They're just like, hey, here's the top 10 names that kids name their kids because normally you register your kid or you get them a Social Security number or some. I don't know how that happens, but it happens. And uh, I should know because I have three kids. Do they have Social Yeah, they do. Okay. Um, <laughs> But anyway, and so I looked up those top 10 and I thought I would bring you the top three male and female boys and girls names from last year. These are just the top three of the 10, um, starting from the third and going up. The third most popular name in 2021 for a boy was Oliver and for a girl was Charlotte. Those are great names, aren't they? Uh, the second most popular name for a boy was Noah and Emma. Emma. Anybody know any babies born with either of these names yet this last year? Okay, yeah, so see, they are popular. And the top name, the most popular name in 2021 in the U.S. for a boy was Liam, L-I-A-M, and Olivia for a girl. So Liam, L-I-A-M, yeah, Liam. Uh, but interesting is that, you know, babies, they don't get to decide what their names are, right? They, they're given that name. And that's the name that their parents are proud of, and they put on the birth certificate. And then sometimes you get a, if it's a long name, you get a, a shortened name. You know, like, like my name is Rex. People say, is that your full name? Is that, is, that your, is that short for something? I say, yes, it is short. It's short for Rexothumus. <laughs> Doesn't that sound good? Sounds great. Sounds great. Yeah. It's, it's Greek for man of many muscles. Unfortunately, <laughs> I shortened it because I'm not living up to my name, and so I just go by Rex. No, it is just Rex. Um, anyway, we don't get to decide what our names are. Our parents do that. But our God, however, the God of Scripture, he gives himself a name. He gets to name himself because he's capital G, God. In fact, the name we're looking at today is the name that he gave himself. That's his divine name that says so much about who he is, that we need to understand the name that he gives him. And the name that is most often used in the Bible is Yahweh. The meaning of God's divine name, Yahweh, is first introduced to us with, with God appearing to Moses in the burning bush in the desert in Exodus. Do you remember this, this story? So I'm going to give you a little backdrop before we get into when Jesus introduces himself and tells him who he is. And basically what's happening is God's people, the Israelite, are living right outside of Egypt. And when they first moved there 400 years before this time, there was a group of like 70 of them. And then over the course of these 400 years, they grew and multiplied and strengthened in numbers. And Pharaoh at the time said, hey, we could really use them as uh, slave labor. And so they were all uh, put under the... Um, the power of Egypt through Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh was having them as slaves and they were being oppressed as a people. And they started crying out to God like, whoa, hold on. we don't want this. God, save us, help us. We don't want to be slaves anymore. God hears the cry of his people because that's what God does, by the way. He hears the cry of his people. And he is going to redeem them, restore them. He's going to take them out of Egypt. And this story happens in the book of Exodus because they exit Egypt on their way to the promised land that God had promised them. And so this is, this is the background to God using Moses to be a part of that rescue, part of that exit. He wants to use Moses. And so he appears to Moses. Now Moses, by the way, if you rewind 40 or so years, I think, uh, he was in Egypt, raised by Pharaoh, but he is a Hebrew himself. He's one of God's people. And he kills an Egyptian soldier. Pharaoh finds out, and so he just hightails it out of town and goes to Midian, and he's trying to hide out there. So he's a fugitive. He killed somebody, and he is, he's now raising sheep for his father-in-law. That's what he's doing. He's hanging out there. Not a bad gig, but that's what he's doing. So we find out, oh, thanks, Todd, I appreciate that. I really do. I know, it was kind of, it wasn't good timing, but anyway. So we find Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, and it would be on the screen, but I encourage you, if you have a Bible with you, open up that Bible. Exodus chapter 3, it's the second book of the Bible right after Genesis, starting in verse 10 of chapter 3. 
So now go, God says to Moses. God tells him, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, real quick, whose people are they? God's. Okay, let's make sure we're there. But Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? My name's not Rex, Rex of, of Lothavus, you know, the, the great man of many muscles. Who am I? And God said in verse 12, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I that have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You will worship God on this mountain. So Moses says to God, well, suppose that I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. They ask me, well, what's his name? What should I tell them? And God says to Moses, I am who I am. Now, just real quick, the Hebrew for this I am who I am is Echye. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am, and then God gives them another name. The Hebrew word for Yahweh has sent me to you. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord your God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, he has sent me to you. God says, this is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. So go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And so Moses, after some other excuses, finally goes. And if you don't, aren't familiar with the story, then I encourage you. Uh, find it there in, in Exodus chapter 3 and, and on. So I mentioned to you that the first name that God says to Moses, he says, I am who I am. Now in Hebrew, if you actually come from the Hebrew translation, the Hebrew word means I will be. And it's the word eh, yeah. Can you say that with me? Eh, yeah. There's an H, E-H-Y-E-H, eh, yeah. This is the Hebrew word, it means I will be. And he's saying, I am that I am. God's saying, I want you to go tell them that eh, yeah, is going to, res- to take them out of Egypt. That's what you're going to say. But because Moses can't stand in front of the people and say eh, yeah, because he is not, Moses is not I am, he has to say he will be. The God who sent me is he, the I am. So he uses the word Yahweh. And he says, that is the God who is coming. Who, By the way, he's the God of your forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And they'll recall all of those of that covenant that God had with Abraham and all of that. And he says, this is the God, the God of your ancestors, who has sent me to you. So let's go. Yahweh, it's the personal name, the divine name of God that he calls himself to Moses. When he says, what should I tell them who you are? He says, you tell them, I am. Now, this personal name of God, Yahweh, appears over 6,500 times in the Old Testament. It is the name of God that's used to identify who is it that we're talking about in Scripture. Now, over the centuries, what's interesting is the Jewish people, they wanted to honor the name of God, the holy divine name of God, and they wanted to be very careful not to break the commandment to misuse the name of God. And so in order to honor God's divine name, when it came to reading scripture out loud, they actually did not want to say the name Yahweh. And so instead, they replaced it with the word Adonai, or Adonai, as we know it, which is Hebrew for Lord. So Yahweh was replaced with Adonai, which is the Hebrew word for Lord. And over the centuries, this practice continued by using the word Adonai or Adonai, Lord, as the name of Yahweh. Now, when it came time to translate into English, the name Adonai was used instead of translating the name Yahweh, so which for us is the word Lord. 
So every time you see the words Lord in all capital letters, it's referring to the name of God of Yahweh. Now, I want to show you this in practice. I want every one of us to take out a Bible, okay? If you didn't bring one, there's one in the pew in front of you. We're going to look up an example of the name of God, capital L, O-R-D, all caps. So look up Psalm 113, verse 1 and 2. If you have a blue Bible out of the pew, you're on page 435. If you picked up a black Bible, and it's the right one that I looked at, it's also page 435. If you picked up a red Gideon Bible, it might be page 627. Or 435. Or 807. Well, that's not the Bible in the pew, James. Come on, you're messing me up. That's your Bible. If you have James's Bible, what kind of Bible do you have, James? I have got a, uh, an, an evidence Bible. Okay. So if you have one of those, it's the number he said. So we're at Psalm 113, verse 1 and 2. Is everybody there? Now, most of these might be NIV. That's what I'm reading from. And so it says this. Now, if you want, read this with me. Whatever translation you have, just read it, okay? And in case you don't have a Bible in front of you, I will have the words on the screen, but don't look at the screen. In fact, no, Luke, let's not put it on the screen. Let's have everyone keep their eyes down if it's on an app or if it's on a Bible, but here we go. We're reading God's word, Psalm 113, 1 through 2, out loud, go. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. You recognize that verse? We actually read that earlier in our worship service before the song, At Your Name. Now, Luke, go ahead and put those words back up there. Did you notice in your Bible, look at it, the word Lord, are all four of those words, letters capitalized in his name? Yes, in every Bible you go to. In fact, I even looked on BibleGateway.com and I looked it up and they do. All of those letters are capitalized except for ours. (laughs) So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> was that a prank by Jeff? I don't know if it was. Maybe it was. I should preview these slides before. He's not here, by the way. Jeff's not here to speak for himself, but he's the one that prepares these for me. I'm very thankful for all of his work. I'm not throwing him under the bus, but come on, that was the point of this whole thing. So take that off the screen because God's word speaks for itself. When you find the word Lord used with all caps, it is speaking of the divine holy name of Yahweh in Scripture. And so you, will, you can count them if you want. It's going to be over 6,000 times that you find it in the Old Testament. The, the name of the Lord, his preferred name that he is to be called, is the name that he told Moses, this is the God who is sending you to take God's people out of captivity. It is Yahweh. I am. I will be. Now, You might think, well, hold on, there is also the word Lord referred to as God in my Bible, and it's not all caps. You're right, because not all words Lord in the Bible refer to his name. For instance, it might say God is the Lord of Lords. It's not speaking of his name, it's speaking of his position, right, that he is Lord of all other small L lords. The first L will be capitalized, but not all of it because it's not his name. Are you following me? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Okay, good. So... This is our, our God, that the I am, Yahweh. Now, this is interesting. Ancient Jewish scribes wanted to prevent people. They wanted to make sure that when people were reading out loud the text, they wouldn't accidentally say Yahweh because it was divine and holy and they were considered it so sacred, they weren't going to say the name, the Hebrew name, the Yahweh, the I am, And so what they would do is they wanted to replace it in Scripture with a combination. It was like a hybrid of Yahweh, well, well, uh, it's our Yahweh now, but Yahweh and Adonai. And uh, so let me show you what I mean. Here's a little kind of name diagram. So what they did was they took Yahweh, which is Y-H-W-H. These are the consonants in the I am Hebrew word, okay? Okay. And they didn't want, they were so sacred, we're not going to say that name, and instead we're going we're gonna to put the words, um, I'm sorry, we're going to take the vowels from um, Adonai and put them in and create a new word that's kind of, that looks like that. Now, that doesn't look like the Yahweh that you're used to, but the green word is what they would have in the text. And the design wasn't so they would read that word. 
It was so they would see that word and go, wait, that's not actually the word Yahweh. Oh yeah, we're supposed to say Adonai instead. So they're reading the text out loud. They come across the Y-A-H-O-W-A-H and they would say Adonai, which means Lord, instead. Now as we translate that into English, that got translated into Jehovah. So many times when you are reading scripture and you see the name Jehovah, it actually comes from English Christian scholars as they translated not recognizing that that was a hybrid word, they put Jehovah in there, but actually it was intended for the name I am. Now, I know that if you're all confused and combobbled, um, that, that's, it's okay. We're going to get where we're going, I promise. <laughs> there are many other popular pronouncements to Yahweh. And we see in our own text, Jehovah. But the bottom line behind all of these names Yahweh, Adonai, Adonai, Jehovah, Lord, is that they speak to the original divine name, I am. This is his name, and his name separates him from any other name. Because no other name is I am. There could be people that, that used to be, but they aren't I am. Oh, he used to be a big deal, but he's not anymore. But our God, he's always a big deal. That's why he's I am, I still will be, and I always will be. So when God told Moses, I am who I am, he was giving us and him a perspective that we need to fully understand about our God. When God says I am, he is the one who was, he is, and he always will be, is what that means. Let me show you this. Yahweh means is I am. It comes from the I am. What it means is God's existence does not depend on anyone else. He is self-existing one. That's who he is. That's why he says I am. I was yesterday, I am today, and I will be tomorrow, and I'm all consistently the same. I'm self-existing. He doesn't need anybody to bring him into existence or to keep him into existence. So Yahweh's name points to his independent existence, and that's why it is so unique, because there's nobody else that can have that name or attempt to have that name and stand on that truth other than our God, Yahweh. Now, what's really cool about his independent existence is the thought that God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything. Name one thing that you think that God needs. Nothing. (laughs) Hey, you answered the trick question. That's good. God doesn't need anything. Nothing needs to be added to him. Nothing can be taken away from him. God cannot be changed. Why? Because God is perfect. This points to a really fun attribute of God to say, immutability. Isn't that a fun word? Immutability. God is immutable. Now, it doesn't mean you can't... That's not what it means. It means that he is unchanging. He doesn't change, he can't change, and he has no need to change because our God is immutable. Now, make sure that you understand it doesn't mean that God is static. It doesn't mean that God is paralyzed or stuck. Just the opposite. Our God is on the move. Our God is active. Our God is alive. He proved that coming out of the grave on the third day. But he is unchanging. He's unchanging in his nature, in his perfection, in his attributes, in his purposes, in his giftings, in his promises, in his word, is unchanging. Nothing ever changes. I want to show you three scriptures that talk about this immutability of our God, our Yahweh. Malachi 3, 6, the first part of the verse says, I, the Lord, do not, help me out, change. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God, help me preach it endures forever. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, help me out, and forever. Our God is unchanging. God cannot be changed, and he remains the same. Just as powerful as he was yesterday, guess what? He's still the same as power today, and he will be the same powerful God tomorrow. Batteries run down, but our God doesn't. When you read about Yahweh in the Old Testament, 
Every time you read a story about Yahweh, you are learning and understanding who this unchanging God is. And I want you to remember that as you read through Scripture. As you read a story, you know, let's, let's pick David and Goliath. You know, we focus a little bit maybe too much on David, but what's happening behind the scenes? What is God actually allowing David to do? Think of that and realize what attribute, what characteristic, what is God able to do there? That same God is the God that we worship today that can still do those same things today. And that's why those stories are there, to show us God's power, to show us his attribute, to show us who he is and how he responds to those he's created. There is no story in the Old Testament that points to something God needs to change. In fact, most of the time, it's somebody else needs to change because our God doesn't change, remember? Um, if you've ever baked some cookies and you've been off a little bit on uh, the salt or the, um, the baking powder or the sugar, you know it, right? If you're off on that ingredient, you just go, you know, there's just something just not quite right, you know, and, and it might need a little bit more salt. It's interesting if you use the wrong kind of butter, you know, it's like, oh, these are way too salty or, you know, or don't call this a chocolate chip when there's only one little piece of chocolate in it. Like, we got to have some chocolate in this thing to qualify for chocolate chip, right? Because it looks like an accident. It's got to look like it's on purpose. And so sometimes we kind of go, you know, it's just missing something. It's just not quite right. It's just not perfect. It's not. And so we kind of go, well, let's do that again. And we got to add this and that just to get it perfect, just to get it right. So we add some things or we have to take something out. But since God is perfect, he does, we don't need to add anything to him. He doesn't have to add anything to himself. He is completely perfect as he has was, as he is, and he always will be. You know, what's interesting is that God can't even change for the better. He's so perfect. Exactly. Why would he want to? You can't get any better than perfect. So he can't add anything, which is why he can't change. If God were to lose something, he would no longer be perfect, which is why God can't even change for the worse, because he's perfect. And he's unchanging and he remains that way. Now, what does this mean for you? What does it mean for you that our Yahweh God was, is, and always will be, which means he's unchanging and he's self-existent? What does that mean? Well, because God is unchanging, you can trust in his sovereignty. His sovereignty is that he is in control and he won't change. He's not going to take a break one day and say, you know what? I did rest on the Sabbath uh, I think I'm going to take this year off too, or this day off too. He's not, he never changes. He is always, always with us, always present. He's always in control. That's our God. He's sovereign. What, how else does this affect, affect you? Well, because God is unchanging, you can trust in his word. The word that you hold in your hands or that you use um, to read God's word, whatever you do, you can trust that word. You can read it. You can believe it because it's never going to change. Now, you may go, well, they have the New Living Translation or they have this translation. Okay, translations might, but the truths will never, ever change. The concepts will never change. The, the way that God directs us will never, ever change. And, you know, because God is unchanging, you can trust his presence to always be with you as you follow him. Because he's true. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. God's unchangeable ways assure you of his unwavering guidance in your life and dependability. So if you've never really fully trusted in God and, and put your full confidence in something that, that you, because you're just not sure, like how, how's God going to work that out? Can I just tell you that God can and will work it out to his perfect plan and you can trust what that is. You can lean on it, like fully lean on it because our God is unchanging and he is the I am. You know, I can recall many times when I was in college going to some of my college advisors or counselors. Some of them happened to be some of my professors. And I would go to them because I would need some counsel on maybe what, what courses to take or what to do in a certain situation because I was having a problem in this or a problem with that. And I would go to them because they had the experience, the knowledge, and the, the, um, the advising ability to give me some direction. And specifically, when I changed majors in my junior year, I went from biology to communications, and I had to sit down with them and go, I don't know what to do. 
And he was like, well, let's think about this. And he advised me, and, and he had, I believe, everything that he needed to help me make the right choice. And that's why I went to him for help, because he had everything that I needed. He had, the back, he had seen many, many students before go through this process for years and years and years and years. And so based on that experience and based on his knowledge, I trusted in his advice. You know, our God is so incredibly amazing and full of wisdom and powerful and unchanging that you can count on him for anything. His ways are perfect. Psalm 1830 states this, God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. There is nothing in there that's false. So you can count on the Bible to guide you in the right ways all the time. God's principles for life never change. You realize that? You know, we've gone through decades and centuries of history, and God's principles have stayed the same and have never changed, even if the world has changed, and yet they're still true. You can still live by them and live the life that God has designed for you to live as his follower. His guidelines in Scripture produce fruitful living as we follow them. And in a world that's always changing, God's word never changes. In a world that's always changing, the world needs a God who is unchanging. Because the reality is when things are changing all around you, the foundation is, it's uneven. Right? It's, it feels like quicksand. It feels like it's a, an earthquake because there's nothing stable in foundation. But God is the foundation because he is Yahweh. He's still just as amazing and good as he was yesterday. And guess what? He'll be just as amazing and good tomorrow. You know, I love the context that God gives us the meaning of his name in Exodus. Anywhere that God could have presented himself as the I am, but he, the, think about the context. Here's Moses hiding out as a shepherd in the desert and God appears through a burning bush, his voice to him, and he asks him to come close to this holy ground, sacred ground. And what he does is he says, hey, Moses, I have heard the cry of my people. And I want to use you. Yes, I know you're, that you're a stuttering murderer, but I want to use you to be a part of my amazing plan. And I want to fill you in on, on what's going to happen right now. Think of that context, the I am, the same yesterday, today, and evermore shall be. The self-existent one shows up in the middle of a desert to a shepherd to say, hey, I'd like your help. <laughs> but you're self-existing, like you're the all-powerful creator. Why do you need Moses? Because Yahweh is a covenant name. And God had established a covenant with his people. Starting with Abraham saying, hey, you're going to have, I mean, great nations are going to come out of you, more people than you can count stars. You're going to go into this promised land. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be G to the double O-D good. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. It's going to G to the double E. I messed that one up. <laughs> I just spelled geed, I think. I'm not sure. And I am going to stay true to my promise. And so Moses, would you come in here real quick? I want to show you, I want to tell you that I am is sending you. This unchanging, self-existing, perfect, powerful God chooses to use you and me as a part of his redemption story because he does redemption in each one of us and he uses every one of us. Why? Because not only is Yahweh a covenant God, but he's a personal God. He's a personal God. He wants to, his people, his creation, to know him. He's not just some self-existing God and some force way up there, wherever, looking down, some cosmic being that doesn't have anything to do. He's a personal Yahweh. And he draws us in close, and he says, this is my plan, this is what I have, and I am sending you. I am who I am, and I am with you. So no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening in your unchanging world, I am not. He's a personal God. 
Yahweh is a compassionate God. It says that he heard the cries of his people and he went to Moses and said, we're going to do something about this. He's a compassionate God. He's a relational God. Every time you see those, the word Lord or Jehovah in the Bible as you read it, think about our Yahweh as a personal, compassionate, relational God, the God of covenant. You know, when we look at the life of Jesus, we see that he is the fulfillment of the covenant name of Yahweh. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but Jesus, um, in John chapter 8, he's talking with some folks who are interested in maybe following him, but they're kind of testing the waters a little bit, like, hey, who are you? What's going on? What are you about? And Jesus is telling them who he is, and is, he's, exp- he's kind of showing them his divinity. He's opening up who he is as the son of God. And then he says in verse 58, he answers them, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am. He uses the same translation of the name of the Lord that we find in Exodus. And they all just go, whoa, buddy. (laughs) Are you sure you want to go there? Because that's blasphemy to claim to be Yahweh. It wasn't because he is was and always will be. And through Jesus, God's covenant to us lives on. His covenant that he is our God and we are his people. And the name of Yahweh, by the way, implies a relationship. He is Yahweh only to those who have a relationship with him, who call on him as their Lord Do you know Yahweh as your Adonai, as your Lord today? Is he the one who you recognize is all sovereign and never changing? And you depend on him for salvation. You depend on him for the breath you take. And you recognize that he is Yahweh, the Lord. If you don't know him as your Savior, if you've never called on him, then today can be a day of salvation for you. Today can be the day where you say, I recognize that you are the I am, and I want to know you as Yahweh as Lord. Forgive me of my sin, and I want to come into relationship with you. And God answers that prayer. He hears that prayer, and he says, come close. I'm your God. I am Yahweh. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we finish this morning. For those of you that already have a faith in Yahweh and claim him as your Lord and Savior, I just say praise God. Keep moving forward. May, it, may his name be a reminder that he's unchanging and that you can count on him. You can lean on him. You can trust in him because he's perfect. And There may be somebody who doesn't know the Lord God Yahweh as Savior and we're in Right now, he is inviting you, he always has, into relationship with him. And if that's you this morning and you say, yes, I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I'm committing my life to him today, if that's you, just put your hand up so I can know who I can pray for. Say, Pastor Rex, that's me. Is there anybody here that just wants to say yes to that this morning? Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Father, for your word. Thank you for your name, Yahweh. We honor, we worship you because you are the God who was, who is, and evermore shall be. And we worship you for who you are. And we also worship you for what you do and for the great things that you do for us. And so, Lord, I I just ask that I will pay attention to your nature as an unchanging God, especially when things around me are always changing. May I focus my eyes on you, the perfecter of my faith. Thank you for that. Lord, would you continue to lead this church in a way that models your love to this community? Or would you help us to spread the name of Yahweh all over Grants Pass and, and Rogue River and Merlin and you go wherever, wherever it is, Lord, that you're calling us to or where we work or live. And so, Lord, because we want others to know this covenant relational God the way that we do. 
So thank you for empowering us to do that work with you. Thank you for calling us as you called Moses. And Lord, may we always call on you as our Lord. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace today. Amen. You are sent. We'll see you next week. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to him and give you a better understanding of his word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.